Hello everyone and welcome to a, another LSA CPD. Uh, today we have uh, Woody Langmuir of Cullen and Studio, um, a practice leader at Cullen and Studio, who will be discussing the need for a broader interpretation of sustainable design and the necessity of reconnecting with nature and what that means for us architects and designers. Um, for those of you who are new to LSA CPDs, um, CPD stands for Collective Peer Development, um, we try to give discussion equal billing to the talk. So Roddy will talk for around 30 minutes. And then after that, we'll have a time for questions and discussion. So if you have any questions, do put them into the chat. Um, uh, if not, you can ask to unmute yourself and I can let you uh, speak uh, essentially to the audience with your camera on if you would like to. Um, but that's how uh, proceedings will uh, take place. And so I guess without further ado, um, I'll let Roddy take the stage. Okay, uh, thanks there, Jason. I'll just uh, share my screen, shall I? Yeah, go ahead. Um, hang on a sec. Okay, so uh, uh, this is this is really a kind of about our own experience as a practice, um, uh, set against the kind of rolling backdrop of uh, changing climate. And I thought it'd be useful if I told you how we've tried to sort of look forward and recognise, you know, underlying themes in our work, um, you know, over the years but then also thinking about how to make them relevant to a rapidly changing context. So I'm gonna talk about the context um, for the profession first, uh, the context of climate change. Then our own kind of practice rethink, which we undertook uh, last year, uh, and offer a few examples um, of the themes that came out of that. So a lot of this is in a way is, um, you know, uh, every day we're bombarded with uh, with information about uh, what's what's happening to our planet. But you have to even think back, you know, ten years ago, and it was marginalised. Uh, people weren't talking about this at all. And despite, you know, over uh, say the last half century, um, the environmental movement has really made amazing sort of success stories uh, in one direction or another. This has always happened on the margins and it didn't really prepare us uh, for the larger global challenges that now reach the headlines almost daily. So climate change, biodiversity collapse and the disconnection um, of our fast growing populations from the natural world. And architects and engineers have known what needs to be done in response to this, but the opportunities have been rare in a fragmented industry without a sort of collective vision. So, yeah, fires, floods, uh, global pandemic, and even in the UK, um, the impacts of climate change are hitting home. Um, so we need to reimagine our dreams of living in isolated castles, um, living with less uh, in denser um, urban populations and less land grabbing sort of energy guzzling suburbia. So there are campaigns to rewild parts of Britain and to radically change our agricultural methods and much more um, all going on outside of our construction industry bubble. I grew up in a, a natural wilderness, uh, the Cairngorm Mountains, where my father ran an outdoor pursuit center. And uh, I've watched the impact of climate change on the most southern area of subarctic tundra in the world, uh, the Cairngorm Plateau. Um, and skiing actually was always a bit marginal in Scotland, but the industries all but disappeared, melted away. As the winters have warmed decade on decade, and occasionally the snow still falls in quantities as the last few weeks have demonstrated, but it now melts too quickly um, to be a reliable platform uh, for a marginal industry. So these are really ironic lockdown pictures of global warming impacts uh, taken last week by my brother. And we all get asked to do our bit, um, but many of us do feel that we're abstracted away from nature and that this obscures the real cost of our lifestyle 
um, you know, carried by nature. Long ago, we used to shit in our own backyard. So we cared about waste and we lived in a more circular, smaller, more locally sustainable society. And now with 60% uh, and rising living in cities, the planet's life support systems are being used up, you know, to feed us, to give us energy, to clean our air and water. And we're increasingly both dependent and disconnected from the natural world. So our lifestyles and our urban habitat, we've lost connection with nature. And many of us are divorced from an understanding of the broken natural cycles and the devastating impact on the environment as a consequence. The sheer scale of the problem and the changes necessary to, to reset that relationship with nature have been made clear in uh, Professor Dasgupta's recent report on the economics of uh, biodiversity, which was actually commissioned by the UK Treasury. And he says that our long-term prosperity uh, relies on rebalancing our demand of nature's goods and services with its capacity to supply them. The report urges the world's governments to come up with a different form of national accounting from GDP and use one that includes the depletion of natural resources. So the report's arguing that radical global changes to production, consumption, finance and education are urgently needed. And those of us working in the built environment have a lot to do. But this context really matters because I actually see where um, our industry fits in in a direction of travel that has wide support. And remember this report was commissioned by the treasury. Um, you know, although it's one thing to sort of commission and another to act on its findings, time will tell. The changes we have to really uh, impact everything we have to do. It's just the way we live, the way we work, um, our education system, our assumptions about economics and the boundaries of our collective responsibilities. And it's all going to change. So it really amounts to a paradigm shift. And that's the, that's the context, that's the background for what we need to do within the construction industry. I mean, it's an amazing backdrop when you think about it to be working um, as an architect in a time of... Um, of great change and incredible challenge to underpin the decisions that we make as designers. Nobody's had it this good before, you could argue. Um, what a brief. But um, I, I want to tell you what we're trying to do as a practice. And as a background to that, we are a cooperative. Um, we share income, we promote diversity, we allow flexible working. We're trying to find ways to work together and to collaborate more and better. It's not really altruism, it's, it's effective, it's good business, and it helps us get under the skin of uh, projects that we work on with our clients. So this is our street in central London with homes that we designed on the left um, next to our offices with the arched windows. I think architects are often environmentalists at heart because you could ask, how can you design environments if you're not? You know, we care but we can also find ourselves trapped in an industry with a huge engine that keeps churning. 40 years ago, Ted Cullinan sketched the Lambeth Community Care Centre. It was a new approach to healthcare, taking it back to the community from the big faceless central hospitals, naturally ventilated solar building, um, opening patients' rooms onto a garden, and all in the intuition that patients would get better faster, and they did. Many architects and engineers have been on similar journeys, exploring low energy natural design. And our ideas are also challenged by experience. Um, 20 years ago, I worked um, with an archeological trust on this project, Archeolink, in a remote part of Aberdeenshire. It's really a sort of rucked up um, rug of grass with a new and very old idea to harness into seasonal storage. It was a marriage between context, purpose, and low energy design. For many years, a great success, but it was founded on a hopelessly optimistic business plan. It couldn't pay its own way in the mean, lean uh, world of no public sub subsidy. And it needed to be more than a low energy building. It needed to be a sustainable business. So a few years back, um, Aberdeenshire, um, pulled their own rug on the funding that supported the project. 
and it's been left derelict, uh, returning gradually to nature. Um, perhaps a modern ruin or a site for a future archaeological dig. A new generation of zero carbon buildings, um, and this is the point, cannot work in isolation of serving real needs. Uh, being essential, being flexible and being enjoyed in use is what will make them last. So this is, section is about what we uh, took on, a bit of introspection as a practice, um, a rethink to look forward. We came up with some themes under the overarching objective that we had to make more room for, for nature. We felt this was not just about better integration of landscape, but how we might interpret nature in the broader sense, making buildings that follow nature's principles. So uh, drawing on and engaging directly with the natural world, um, giving a sense of ownership to the communities that will use our buildings, buildings that are health giving, uh, using non-toxic materials, fresh air, daylight, etc and also adopting the natural principles of the circular economy, zero carbon, net energy producing, flexible and recyclable, and buildings that combine to frame outdoor spaces and streets which, which let nature thrive in the city. Now, most practices organize their work by studios or by sectors, um, housing, education, etc. And we were looking out for a way to really infuse everything we do with these cross-cutting themes or threads. And this weave diagram um, expresses that. So our aim uh, was to be able to go to clients and explain why, for example, understanding how to design a therapeutic environment for mental health patients in a children's hospital might actually influence how we design better homes. Or why an outdoor education um, you know, classroom based on horticulture that we designed for the RHS, the Royal Horticultural Society, should be included in every primary school as part of every child's education about nature. I've had a go at a few examples under each of the, the five themes um, to sort of bring this to life. It's all work in progress. So what we've done doesn't always reflect what we would do next time. And I'm also very aware that our practice experience sits alongside the work of many other architects. So it's an eclectic mix. Many architects have pushed at the boundaries, often further than our own in one direction or another. And we see this as part of a sort of collective campaign to change the way we do things. First, the most obvious theme, um, the efforts to welcome in the natural world to the indoor and outdoor rooms of our projects and set up better connections to nature. So we had uh, a dingy two foot wide gravel strip outside our office. Um, now, Robin Nicholson's Gorilla Garden on the towpath. And it's given our office a place to sit outside in the sun at lunchtime and a way of interacting with the community that walk along the canal, commuters and walkers and tourists. And in the summer, it becomes a front door uh, to our events program inside. Getting urban populations down to the water edge steered this project in Chicago by Sasaki Associates. Um, now, once a, a hard industrial edge, it's become a haven for citizens, nature, wildlife, and a place for people to enjoy the experience of the river in the city, and an incredible transformation um, for the citizens. This is one of ours where we tried to connect visitors in the forest uh, through this project. Um, it's not yet built, but it's a treetop walkway with canopy classrooms in the National Forest in Leicestershire. And education has most impact um, when it's set in the environment it seeks to explain. So these um, hedgehog shaped grid shell classrooms sit up there in the canopy. Knowledge and experience of nature is also power to the next generation. And this is the Clore Education Centre for the RHS in the middle of their gardens at Hyde Hall. Classrooms wrapping around a horticultural courtyard. And here a pavilion in Edinburgh's Royal Botanic Garden, uh, where their brief was to explore and explain uh, the world of plants. 
The building's really a demonstrator full of renewable energy techniques and biophilic design responses. You feel you're still in the garden inside beneath a canopy of engineered trees. As Professor Das Gupta says, we need to get our industry um, back within the biosphere rather than pitched against it. Of course, you cannot create community, um, but you can offer the tools and the environment that will help one to grow stronger, or you can help an existing community settle more easily into new surroundings. And this needs the architect to recognize the patterns that make social spaces work well and remove the barriers. It's a big subject, so I'm really just skimming the surface uh, today. The point is that without a community invested in their place, taking ownership, the buildings and spaces you create won't be looked after or loved. So they won't settle into the fabric of our environment and they won't last. Critically, they won't last. The generosity of shared indoor and outdoor spaces, their design for well-being and inclusivity determine their success. So we've worked with uh, the residents of Stonebridge for a number of years, and this project managed to squeeze a community event space between two wings of flats that were pre-sold to fund it. Rather than make separate buildings, we mixed up uses to help cross-fund the running costs of the community centre with rental from a supermarket and a health centre. There's a civic space out front and a garden at the back. The crossover of different uses also brings higher footfall to each of them. And the flats above generated the capital um, originally and now ensure a constant flow of customers. Right beside their community hub, Shared gardens help connect new residents of 100 uh, homes with a, a feeder canal reopened and the buildings framing this shared outdoor space. There's private and, uh, and also shared gardens that are integrated rather than separated. The social value always being uh, most acute in the thresholds between those private and shared outdoor spaces. And I really like this scheme by Ash Sakula um, called the Mailings in Newcastle, where fingers of landscape um, look down towards the river. And they're shared gardens. They look like shared gardens, but they're mostly an aggregation of private front gardens um, with careful control of thresholds. So the architects here took a few decisions that uh, many of the, the new residents now have a chance to establish connections with neighbours. So they use low walls and planters uh, to encourage conversations, helping develop a neighbourhood where people can meet and talk naturally. And by doing so, combat um, feelings of loneliness. They have cycle stores and recycling areas where they're used as opportunities to promote informal encounters uh, between the residents. And there's shared resources such as communal allotments. They also built a, what they call a feasting table uh, where the residents can hold parties um, and events. But crucially, all these decisions were taken with full consultation with the residents and in reaction to their dialogue. This is the, uh, you might call it the feasting table at our Maggie's Cancer Care Centre in Newcastle. Uh, the kitchen table is always a key part of the Maggie's brief. And it's a place where conversations between strangers can happen naturally or not. And the Maggie's Brief is full of ideas about the restorative effect of natural materials and integrated landscape spaces. So you've got to ask why this brief doesn't govern the design of our hospitals. And then taking that a step further, don't we all deserve healthy buildings all the time? Why just when we're sick? For example, in our homes, um, you know, and while this house we designed in Amersham is clearly a large home, the principles of using natural materials and bringing in daylight and creating intermediate spaces, part inside and out, like this bay window, um, offering a place to reflect. And these hold true for, for any home. We're working right now on a new project designing for mental health at Alder Hay Children's Hospital, uh, working with Turkington Martin um, on the landscape design too. So it's a cluster of services brought together to make consultations easier for patients with complex mental health issues. A separate 12 bed residential building 
uh, called the Dowie Jones uh, Building, looks after young adults with serious conditions over six months to two years uh, for their stay in the building. And the hospital's known as Alder Hay in the Park. So we were aware of the research on the impact of the natural environment on our health and mental health with this concept of nature deficit disorder uh, being something that's been explored um, by many different uh, researchers. It's a well-trodden path. So you've got to ask yourself, how can you become a good custodian if the natural world of the natural world as an adult, if you're detached from it as a child? We've also referred to this series of researched patterns that relate biophilic design to biological responses. So some examples of this are visual connection with nature, dynamic light conditions, changing temperatures and airflow, and so on. And it gave us a new kind of brief. These are our buildings uh, shown blacked out with uh, surrounding courtyards, uh, the residential unit um, up to the uh, top and right of the page, and then the open U-shaped courtyard of the cluster building looking into the new park and the hospital down here in white, the existing hospital by BDP, um, setting up that context of the, the hospital in the park. So the question is, could this be a new blueprint um, for the way the NHS works and the way the NHS is responsible for the health of the community? Um, you know, not just, just people when they're ill. So here's a, a view of the park, um, expansive park, which is that interface between community and hospital. And then shared spaces in our cluster building, um, gathered around um, by cloisters, which access the consulting rooms and opening onto courtyard gardens. The engagement space giving places where you can sit in isolation, um, you can do a bit of uh, work on a laptop while you're waiting, um, or you can uh, sit together in small groups, giving opportunities, all looking into the garden. And then down the, the cloistered wings, subweight spaces uh, to gathering series of consulting rooms together and sitting on the edge of, uh, of the park against plants growing against the windows. So the courtyards are functional uh, courtyards, giving an experience of landscape with different themes. And the buildings are all made of, of timber, of CLT, exposed, robust finishes that will, you know, will, will endure, will take a kicking but which also have natural qualities, uh, which are part of that whole therapeutic uh, feel of the building. And again, there's evidence to, to show that stress reduction um, and other factors can be uh, taken from using natural materials. And here are the buildings uh, are looking towards that new park. And now on site, um, despite the, the pandemic um, going up, very quickly. By complete contrast, and not a place obviously associated with our health, uh, this project is looking to drive technical innovation in the car industry. I say car industry, but the research is actually much broader. A mobility revolution is happening um, across transport. And this is really about a connection between academia um, industry and researchers all brought together under a single roof. And we've made this internal space, which is a crisscross of movement routes, climbing over large workshop spaces, allowing the researchers from different disciplines to collide for a conversation and all under a single umbrella roof that unites everyone towards uh, the common goal. Full of daylight, um, and largely made of timber. So the natural environment outside is brought close. Uh, cafes and exhibitions and student events can spill out into it. The walls are made of timber cassettes, giant mega panels, um, 
based on CLT, insulated outside, prefabricated in Austria and, uh, and brought here. And the roof is made of glue lamb um, overlaid by CLT engineered timber planks across a very busy roofscape uh, for daylight and PV arrays and all the technical plant that's brought up there. This building would normally be out on a science park or uh, you know, far from the, the heart of a university where this um, centre sits in Warwick. So it's showcasing a uh, green, uh, green future um, for transport. So this theme, circular economy, um, is really about allowing construction um, to address the challenge. Our, we have a preference as architects for the new and the shiny over using as much as possible of what already exists. And, you know, we have to, we have to change our, um, our methods and our thinking, uh, looking at ways of reconditioning materials and buildings and designing for end of life. It really challenges our concept of waste. And as architects, we choose to see this as a challenge to our creativity uh, rather than a dumbing down of our skills. So we've had some practical experience. This is our office in Islington, um, where we had to gut um, the derelict building on the canal to create our new office. And we've managed to see the impact of a fabric first approach because we were actually moving um, next door, moving sideways from a very similar, uh, similar building and could measure um, everything about that move, um, finding that we were, for instance, saving 75% uh, of our energy and use costs. So we couldn't afford to do everything we wanted to, but um, We've, we've made a start. Lots of other architects have chosen to refurbish rather than demolish and build. And I love the, the creative transformation of these two ups and two downs by Shed KM in Salford. Um, creating gardens over the backs and bringing light through the chimney pots that give the scheme its uh, name. The age old principle that buildings should speak about how they're made still holds too. And this is the John Hope Gateway in Edinburgh, where rainwater is collected in a large tank on the roof of uh, the WCs, which fill the cisterns in full view of the public entering the Botanic Garden. And my partner, Colin Rice, uh, built himself a thrifty house that sits gently on the Norfolk coast landscape on recycled sleepers and put together from a multitude of uh, salvage bits and bobs. So we're beginning to think of materials and products being leased for the life of a building by manufacturers, perhaps, reused at the end of life and using resource mapping to obtain materials from man-made waste, mining the Anthropocene as it's termed. It follows the concept that waste is simply a resource waiting for a new purpose. Duncan Baker Brown's Waste House was an experiment in creating a research building made entirely out of recycled components. And this is Beer Architects Project, Lark Rise, an all electric passive house. It produces twice the energy it consumes and it takes 97% less energy from the grid than the average house. So it exports energy to the grid. Scaling up the real innovation lies in the idea of a universal energy grid where buildings are net producers and by smart systems can be linked to form de facto power stations. We're also involved ourselves in new infrastructure um, projects. And this one is working with a, a team of experts uh, researching the creation of a low temperature heat network in Islington called Green Skies. It takes waste heat from the underground data centers and many buildings which, uh, which give off heat, the more heat they can use that require cooling. And it redistributes them to homes and to schools um, in the neighborhood. All of this work shows how we can transform the construction industry to use circular systems, a construction ecosystem in step with nature's cycles. 
it's a fast changing scene with loads of opportunities to be explored creatively. My last theme of the five is future streets and the drive for nature in our public realm. This is a new street in Bristol, part of our Bristol Harborside development, uh, working with developer Cress Nicholson and landscape architect Grant Associates. The master plan uh, transformed a former gasworks site into a new city district with two principal axes or pedestrian routes that lock the public realm of the proposals into the public realm of Bristol. One street takes you from the city cathedral all the way down to the waterfront. The other completes the Brunel Mile from Templemead Station to the SS Great Britain. Eddies off the route make places to pause and enjoy the natural environment. Then down at the waterfront, the river edge has to cope with a huge tidal range, so floating reed beds and hinged walkways help you get close. The master plan connects these three natural pedestrian thoroughfares to each other, allowing nature-rich public space to steer the entire development. The future street that's fast becoming reality is one where the autonomous car is a pollution-free service that you pay for rather than a possession, meaning the space on our streets given over to park cars can be taken back for nature. And this is uh, Place Design Group's Future Street project in Sydney, um, where they've scaled this up and tried to, through an exhibition of the street, point to how the um, embedded green and smart infrastructure for a post-autonomous vehicle world would actually work. And then I thought I'd finish um, with this week's news that James Coroner's team has won the Camden Highline competition. He calls it a unique public green thread that ties its various communities together, an elevated park along a viaduct that speaks to the symbiosis of nature, culture, arts, and community. Big claims, but you have to ask, if we can do this on a part active railway line, why can't we transform our streets at ground level in a similar way? So thanks, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen now and then uh, see if there are any, any questions. Thank you very, very much, that Woody, that was fantastic. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, do put them in to the chat function and I can read them out or if you feel so inclined, I can just unmute you. Um, but I've got a few to kick off. Um, and it kind of riffs on what you said at the end there, working with landscape architects. How valuable has working with landscape architects been? What have been like the most important lessons you as an architecture firm have learned from them? Well, I think, I mean, firstly, there shouldn't really be a distinction between okay. architects and landscape architects. And I think the best landscape architects have always appreciated what um, the interface between the professions really means and what it can do. So, um, you know, I think um, it's interesting that our culture in the UK has been to treat landscape very much as an add-on, as an optional add-on um, to, mm -hmm. to our built environment. And that doesn't hold everywhere. In fact, in the States, the landscape architects are given master plans and architects work within the landscape architects team. So they set the, um, you know, the primary agenda for a new, uh, a new site. Um, so I think, I think you can learn a hell of a lot and you have to be open to involving, um, as you do with, with engineering disciplines, involving uh, the team in mm -hmm. the development of a design and not think of this as a, as you know, any project as a sort of architect's um, creation that needs to be en uh, enabled by the other professions. So I think we have a good, in the UK, we have a good collaborative culture. Mm. The design professions all work pretty well together. Um, and the best results always come when there's a good rapport uh, between them all. Um, I was gonna say, well, I was also gonna follow up a second of what more do, 
how could that collaboration be strengthened? How can that relationship be more fruitful moving forward if you think there's a way for that to happen? Um, well, I think um, the frustrations that that we feel in the UK are usually about the artificial divisions that that come into the development of the design of a project. You know, you really have to be able to see something through to 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 get the quality. And um, I mean, I pointed to some examples mm. there of. Uh, very seemingly very small decisions. Um, you know, for example, Asakula keeping the uh, boundaries between individual front gardens to a very, very low level. So there would be natural overlooking and connection between, uh, between fronts. Those kind of things are, seem to be tiny and, and actually don't come into the dialogue until very late on you know, in the in the, uh, the process of design. And we can often find that we're, um, uh, even as a collaborative team, you know, we're cut out. We, we get to planning and then another team uh, working for the contractor um, takes over and, and delivers the scheme. So that, that all those false structures in procurement can get in the way of the continuity um, of a design developing well into that into the detail, so I think um, I think that's a that's a that's a big problem. Agree. I've got a question from Jack Idle here. He says, "Roddy, thank you for the fantastic talk. Do you have any advice for a young practice on where to find sustainable projects? Could you expand on how you started out and got clients interested in sustainability?" Um. Well. I think um, I think every project is uh, an opportunity for a sustainable project. So there should be no there should be no project which isn't that, and that's really asking for everyone to look at the decisions they make. You know, even as a, as an architect within within uh, a large team uh, making decisions in one particular element of a building. All those decisions um, have environmental consequences and can, you know, can um, uh, work for the common good um, or not. So, so I think that's the first thing. Is it's everything that you do uh, needs to be held in that terms. And you can't win all your battles, um, but starting with whatever you do in design, um, in that way uh, would would be a big help. Um, in terms of starting out, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I've never really um, thought that I was doing anything else. I've never really seen um, the divisions that we were talking out about between landscape and, and buildings. And partly perhaps, you know, being being brought up in, um, in a, a, an amazing landscape um, might have might have influenced me, but I think the practice has has also you know has a, a huge backlog of work which explores landscape and the relationship between uh, buildings and building users and landscape. So that continuity has been part of my education as a young architect growing up in in this practice. Mm -hmm. And I th I th whenever we talk about connecting to nature, whenever I think people particularly talk about biophilic design as well, one project that I always see outside purely architecture spheres is the Stefan Dwari Bosco, Ver Bosco Verticale, Verticale building in Milan. Yeah. I kind of get in kind of contemporary online forums, kind of gets uh, bashed a little bit for, for greenwashing. Yeah. And I wanted to know kind of, what your perspective, not on that building per se, but on how mm. architects can have uh, a productive conversation with clients about greenwashing and how to not you know, put greenery, greenery in the sake of buildings for the sake of it. Well, I, I think it's it's knowledge, isn't it? I mean, the mm. uh, as I understand it, that project in Milan at least was followed with quite a, 
an intense level of sort of horticultural understanding yeah. and expertise in delivering trees on balconies in the air. Um, you know, we, we worked on a big project in Singapore um, quite a while ago, and we created these green facades um, which shaded the buildings. They were a bit less um, heavy on the infrastructure requirements, like no, no um, massive uh, concrete shelves needed to support them. So they were really like hedge-like plants, um, you know, growing against the side of the building. And of course, in Singapore, um, plants can seed in the air. I mean, it's an incredible growing environment. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the, the, the knowledge, the education, um, and this is kind of what's, what's happening. You know, greenwash is going to be left behind because as we up the, the level of our, um, of our education in the true issues for the environment, mm. we won't, we won't, we won't, greenwash will be so obvious. Nobody will even try to try to pass it <laughs> off. Um, so I, so I think that that's happening. I think it's probably happening gradually but I think it is happening. Yeah, well, fingers crossed, I guess. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you'd also done any kind of occupancy post or current occupancy studies uh, relating to kind of well-being um, of projects that you mentioned or other projects that Colin, Colin has worked on. Yeah, we were right in the middle of one um, with the National Automotive Innovation Centre uh, mm -hmm. when the pandemic struck. So we'd, we'd literally just started doing it. And we were really interested because... You know, these were were um, scientists and researchers, um, and you know, uh, people. Some of them, some of them, petrol heads. You know, coming from the car industry, working in that building, and we were trying to create a new new kind of environment for them that would that would help their work. So um, we were really keen to see what the impact of that building um, is, and and still are. So yeah, we'll 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 carry on with that process. Um, I think it's, you know, we're a small practice. We haven't got a, a huge number of projects to draw on, but there are plenty, um, uh, you know, plenty of exercises by, by others um, drawing those kind of results together. And that's where we need to be pooling our, our information and knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think in the past, um, architects have perhaps seen, maybe even still do, see um, that kind of information as their USP, you know, and they don't want to give it away to, uh, to others. But really, the only way to, um, you know, to advance the industry is for everyone to share that kind of knowledge. Um, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, not the, it's not the architect's fault, it's the, the clients who don't want to, to uh, you know, let information that's seen as sensitive about their, their workforce out. But um, no, definitely the more, the more open we can be, the more we can all learn. Mm -hmm. um, uh, speaking of kind of clients in that regard, I was wondering if you had to convince any clients of making space for nature, allocating a uh, floor area and say, look, you know, this might be better if we have it for planting, for example, and what those kind of conversations look like when you're having to kind of persuade them. Yeah, I mean, I think I think sometimes you're you're pushing at an open door, um, and the conversations are easy. Mm -hmm. um, I think the evidence that we need, a bit's related to the last question, that if you've got the evidence, you can make an argument, and you know, in terms of well-being, um, evidence can relate directly to productivity. Mm -hmm. And if you can relate, um, you know, uh, that kind of evidence to a client for a particular way of, of going about something, um, then it's quite compelling um, when they're struggling to, you know, to make the, make the money work. So, you know, I think everything's always in competition and uh, at its best, you don't need extra space to do these things. You do it within what you've got, and you um, you use that that space that's required for other reasons in a different way, um, you know, rather than demand additional space. Sure. Um, you mentioned someone 
who earlier on in the talk who mentioned uh, to get our industry back into the biosphere. I was wondering if you could remind me who that was. Um, Professor Dasgupta. Dasgupta. That, yeah, his report. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he, it's a phenomenal piece of work. Um, and it's, it's uh, quite a, I mean, this is literally, I think it came out a couple of weeks ago, um, mm. 600 page report. So I've not read it. I've, I've, I've been through the abridged version. Um, but probably the most remarkable thing about it is, it, is that it's been um, commissioned by the, the Treasury. And this is obviously with COP26 coming up in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Britain getting itself ready to be a kind of um, a leader in that respect. But um, I think it's, uh, again, it's full of evidence. These, these are places where you can draw on the evidence you need. Um, mm. And, you know, the cost is hidden. The cost, that's what he's basically saying, that all um, the costs to nature, which we have to pay in the long run because we can't do without them, um, they don't get they don't get billed in a in a sort of GDP world or in a, a capital cost you know uh, trumps everything world. So finding new ways to um, for economics to to um, to change uh, the basis of how we how we do things is is pretty amazing. It's pretty fundamental, really. Mm. Um, and I do think, you know, the construction industry is, is the, is a slave often to, you know, to other, to other, uh, fields and other, other professions. So we've not always taken a, a very concerted kind of look at what we're doing as an industry, um, what direction we're going in. I mean, it's interesting th seeing things, you know, happening now and, um, you know, there's been a lot of, I think it's the, the, the sort of newsworthy nature of um, environmental crises is meaning that, that you're often, that open door is, maybe it was, sh it was slammed shut 10 years ago. It's definitely opening now. And, you know, in some cases, it's wide open and people are saying, you know, what does this mean? What can you, you know, can you di design for uh, for us with taking all this on board? Sure. And do you find other people kind of relying on, on you as architects now as cons to, you know, to consult on, well, I guess that's a redundant question. <laughs> do you mean to, um, I mean, uh, I suppose we're getting involved in unusual sectors, if you like. So, yeah, you know, yeah. why are we why are we working on infrastructure in Islington, for instance? So, you know, we did a bridge uh, a project for um, first time in the world, actually, that that waste heat from the underground um, has been used, um, and that's called Bunhill in, in Islington. So the Green Skies project that I mentioned is a sort of follow on from that. But there, these, um, the low temperature network of, of pipes has to go, sometimes has to go above ground to avoid barriers. So it mm -hmm. becomes part of the public realm. So how we're there to try and think of how this new street infrastructure might be used to, to positive benefit. And how could we bring natural, uh, the natural world in, you know, with with this opportunity? So that's a kind of that's not something you you saw on the tin when you when you became an architect. <laughs> that's a good thing, really. Like, it's, otherwise, it becomes far too siloed. You could argue. Um, yeah. I've got a question from Chris. I'm going to read out. He says, regarding greenwashing, have you ever had a situation where you thought that a client was cynically using your reputation? And have you ever felt compelled to walk away from a project? Um, well, we we walk away from some projects for uh, for other reasons, um, you know, ethical ethical reasons. Um, you know, we turn 
projects down in Saudi Arabia, for instance. Um, we generally have quite a wide um, acceptance of conditions because often there's a lot you can do, uh, positive, a lot of positive things you can do. And um, you don't want to uh, become a kind of, you know, ivory tower practice that that only only works when the temperature is just right. You know, we've we've got to be able to uh, to change people's minds and and influence people, and that's often done by you know at the coalface if you like. It's done it's done by working on the project. So I think that's an important important thing. Um, I think. Uh, Perhaps we've strayed into a bit of green. Well, I'm trying to think of an example. I'd like to be honest about this because I don't, um, you know, I think I think we've probably made mistakes. Um, and uh, the project I showed you, uh, Archeolink in, in Scotland, um, was was not a. It wasn't so much a, a mistake, but it was a very it had a, a very particular um, approach, architectural approach, which, which I think um, was as as a team, we strayed from the the uh, the consequences, if you like, of the business plan for the project. Yeah. Um, and I think it's. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens to that project. I'd love somebody to take it on and uh, convert it. You know, we should be refurbishing buildings now, so so mm. it'd be great if somebody could could take that on. Um, it's got squatters in it at the moment, uh, living in <laughs> living in the visitor centre. Oh, not a bad use, maybe. Yeah, it's, 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 at least it's being used. You could argue. Yes. Um, I there, there are a lot of maybe smaller and younger practices within our network and obviously maybe within this audience as well and obviously students. And I'm kind of curious to know what the initial dialogue you have when you collaborate with uh, landscape architects or um, uh, practitioners that, that were within that profession, what they look like and what kind of questions, initial questions you're asking. I, don't, I think, I think uh, you know, <laughs> when you're, when, when certainly I'll give my own experience when I, when I, started um our education is quite often mm -hmm. largely focused on the the object of making a building um so you know it's it's quite complex there's so many issues um and we we think of of space as building up space and building up making making object buildings um out of a series of spaces but the more you work, the more you realize that the really important spaces are the spaces between the buildings and the spaces that affect us all the most um, and that impact society greatest um, are the spaces in between. And if you think from that perspective, um, you're beginning to think like a landscape architect because you're beginning to think about um, you know, orientation isn't just about the way the light comes into your building. It's the way the building shelters um, the space that it creates and, um, and how the sun reaches that space. So it's all cause and effect. And the two, the sort of yin yang of, of um, you know, buildings and, and space between buildings um it's just such a fascinating mm. subject you know we're buildings are are man-made topography in a continuous landscape so you know that that um i think i mean I, I, as i said we never never really struggled to have a good dialogue with with uh, landscape architects mm -hmm. um um, and how does that kind of fit in with the kind of notion of rewilding as well? Is that because there's also this difference between um, planting, which is very much a, like a human endeavor, and then there's rewilding. And I was wondering, like, how 
those different elements kind of creep into projects, how you allow them in? Yeah, I mean, we, the John Hope Gateway, I just showed a couple of slides yeah. of, um, has a, a large biodiversity garden, um, which is kind of surrounded by the, the exhibition space in the building. So there's, a, there's a basically a glass window about 60 meters long that uh, in a convex curve that, that embraces this biodiversity garden that sets out the species that are important to biodiversity um, from waterborne uh, species up to the arboretum, uh, you know, the trees. But it's, it's almost like a sort of order of the species of biodiversity because a biodiverse <laughs> garden is, uh, is, a wild, is a wild garden, which is allowed, you know, is allowed to um, develop in a place um, without assistance, if you like. Um, mm. So we've, I mean, we have worked in a lot of um, very manicured garden spaces for, I mean, I mentioned the RHS we work yeah. with, we've worked with the Botanic Gardens at Kew um, and also at Edinburgh. Um, and rewilding um, is, you know, is obviously hugely, hugely important. Um, I mean, our entire landscape is man-made. Um, and even when you get to the those wilderness type spaces like the Cairngorms that I was I was talking about, mm -hmm. you know they've been so heavily impacted by uh, deforestation long time ago, um, and you know rewilding. I don't know. There's a there's a Danish um, guy who's who's um, who's bought up former owner of Assos or current owner of Assos. He uh, has bought up a huge tract of Scotland. Um, in central highlands and to the, to the west coast and he's he's the one who wants to you know he wants to bring back the wolves and the and, and the bears and rewild the landscape but he's he's doing so on quite um quite thorough grounds he's got quite a good um long-term agenda he's looking 200 years ahead about change in his in his landscape and you know i think that's amazing to, to have somebody who's invested his his money in a project like that. What's his name? Do you, can you remember? Oh, I can't remember his name. Um, if I search ASOS lands. ASOS, um, Scottish landowner. Oh, that should get, you. <laughs> should get you it. That's an interesting ontology he has. I think it's probably something most within the built environment or unbuilt environment uh, should probably adopt as well, given the, the crisis that we face. Um, I'm conscious of time. I think we've got one minute left. So I was wondering if there's any kind of passing comments that you wanted to make before we kind of wrap up. Uh, no, I mean, um, happy to answer any more questions that come in. If, a, if your students write in or whatever, you can forward those on to me. Um, but no, good to, good to talk to you all. Uh, they usually always are. So <laughs> keep me posted. Okay. Uh, good stuff. Thank you so much for your time, Audrey. Um It's been a pleasure. Okay. Uh, we do have another CPD coming up next week, uh, so do stay tuned. And what will uh, be more announcements uh, to come for March and April as well. But beyond that, have a lovely week and thank you again, Woody. Okay. Thanks, everyone.